Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Hello, David. Doing well. Hi, everyone. Excellent. Well, it's very wonderful to have you. We have a whole lot of folks here to learn about, you know, the director side of engineering, the VP side of engineering, how to level up, what makes, you know, a good director from a great one, et cetera. I'd love to first just start with uh, kind of the general hello intro from your end. You know, feel free to share a brief background about yourself. All right. So hi, everyone. So maybe I should say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Seems like there are lots of people from all around the world. So thank you for, for being part of this uh, discussions and, and fireside chat. A little bit about myself. My name is Richard Wong, um, uh, SVP of Engineering at Coursera. I'm responsible for product development, infrastructure, security, and IT at Coursera, basically everything technology side. For those of you who may not be familiar with Coursera, we are an online education company now with over 78 million users around the world. We serve our learners with a wide range of products to help them to acquire new skills through, you know, starting from hands-on projects that take them maybe an hour or two hours to learn some new skills and uh, courses and all the way of getting a master's degree like, from our platform, uh, you know, from our partners like, through our platform. Our mission is really to make education available and accessible to anyone anywhere in the world. I've been with Coursera for the last six years. It was, uh, it's been a super exciting ride to see how the company evolved from an early stage startup to where we are. And before Coursera, I was with LinkedIn. I joined LinkedIn as a as a late stage startup at that point. While I was at LinkedIn, I was responsible for their talent solutions and the and the and LinkedIn's international expansions. And before LinkedIn, I started my career at Microsoft about twenty years ago. First as an engineer, and later became a manager where I work on a number of different products like Windows, System Centers, Hotmail, et cetera. So that's that's pretty much a, a little bit about myself. Awesome. And I know when we were chatting just before this, you know, I, I learned this about your background. I guess that when you were at Hotmail was uh, right before I joined the Gmail team, we were talking about kind of the, the learnings and the evolution of that, that time and that experience in the heyday of, you know, 2005 plus or minus. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that's, that's the power of technology. So I remember, so story, I was just talking to David before was, uh, I was in a Hotmail team um, in the early 2000s um, and I worked there for a few years. So one of the, the most memorable story probably was in, I think it's 2003 or 2004 when Hotmail came, uh, when Gmail came out. So we definitely pay attention to our competitors, right? But Gmail actually announced that story or their, their product on an April 1st. So everyone in our team kind of think, wow, okay, this is a pretty crazy thing because they offer one gigabyte of free storage to all the email users from Gmail. But we thought it was a joke. We thought it was not real because it's April 1st. We, you know, you know, people kind of ignore it and say, okay, this is not real. Because at that point, like most of the email provider offer maybe one megabyte or two megabytes of free storage to their users when Gmail announced that they offer one gigabyte of storage. But after a few days, it, uh, we figure out this is not a joke, this is real. And because Google keep talking about that, kept talking about that, so you know that's where I think technology innovation really happens and can change the world. And you know, you know, we definitely scramble and figure out what is our reaction uh, to you know catch up with the competition and potential breakthrough that we need on a on a on a business on our product. But you know, the rest of it, the rest is history. But I think that inspire me all the time to think about you know product and technology, they always come in a way that is very unexpected. A breakthrough of technology can fundamentally change how things work in the world and bring the world to a completely different level. Yeah. 100%. And uh, I guess we see companies evolve, the people amongst those companies going from place to place. I mean, it's the nature of the business we're in. So it's kind of, it's been interesting to see how things have progressed. So I see, um, you know, folks have already started putting in questions in the Q&A. Folks, if you have questions yourself, Feel free to put them in and upvote questions that other people have. It's in the Q&A tab on the top. It's right next to the chat tab. So feel free to go in there, add your questions, upvote them. I'll tee this off with just a, a first kind of starting question for you and then we'll probably end up going to, to Q&A here, which is, you know, when people think about being a director, at, you know, of engineering at, a, at an organization, I think everyone has a different understanding of what they think of that makes them a good director versus a great director. Uh, I'm curious to hear from your perspective, you know, what you think distinguishes uh, a good director versus a great director of engineering? Uh, I think that's a great question. So, you know, first of all, maybe you can define a little bit about term of, of like what is a director of engineering. So, because I, I, I think sometimes it's hard to describe their responsibility using a title because the same title can mean very different thing at different companies. So for example, you can be a director of VP of engineering at a startup of like two people. 
or you can be a director of VP of engineering with like a thousand people reporting to you in a in a very big company settings, right? So I think for the sake of this conversation, maybe we can talk about uh, maybe the more common case um, for most of us here is the director of engineering is usually the second or third line managers. You don't manage individual contributors directly. You rely on a set of direct reports that do, who are typically managers or senior managers in your team uh, to deliver some important business mission. So your individual engineer manager, they may have a they may have a group of people. Basically, they have an agile team to solve a set of problems within your business space. But as a director, you are collectively responsible for all the different components that's needed to deliver the business result. So that is basically approximately I think about you know the, for the sake of conversation about what director is. Now, when you ask about a question about, you know, what differentiate between a good one and a great one. So first of all, I'm learning about that as, you know, as an engine leader, how I can become better over time as well. But I also think that like good and great is not, it's not a binary thing. So people don't change from good to great with just one thing. It's usually a spectrum. Like people need to continue to work towards a set of things to, to get them to become better and better. At some point they become a great leader in the organization. But, uh, my version at very high level is, uh, I, I think about it in a few ways. Um, so maybe I, I can encourage our audience to, to kind of do this reflection quickly together with me. Uh, you don't have to type anything in the, in the chat or answer, or, but you just like, think about yourself. Um, so a few questions that I ask myself and my team always is about uh, the first question, do you think the level of your ownership and responsibilities that you have change over in the last year and if it did change did it happen or i assume it's expansion did it change because it was just situational or you were told to do that or you actually sought those opportunities so that's one question i i will ask you the second question i'll ask is assume that your team definitely deliver more has bigger impact is it because you just add more people in the organization or you have driven innovations in organization that allow people to be more productive, efficient, get job done faster, better. They allow you to achieve the same level of results with actually theoretically fewer people. And you're excited about these kind of innovation than just like adding more people in your team. So think about this. Uh, the third question I would always ask is about, do you know, no, so you probably know very well about the challenges in your team, the opportunities in your team. But do you know what is bothering, or uh, you know, or, or is exciting to people work with you? That means your peers. Like when I say your peers, it could be a cross-functional partners, it can be other directors of engineering in the organization. Did you do anything in the last year to help them to meaningfully solve those challenges and problem, and and help them to achieve better results, even though those may not be your direct responsibility? And the fourth question I would ask is. Um, is about the people in your team. So you, as a director of engineering, you have a number of people reporting to you. They are managers, they are leaders in the company. Did they also demonstrate expanded scope of impact? Or when the promotion cycle comes up, calibration cycle comes up, do you scratch your head and talk about why they deserve a promotion or a good review? Or it is so obvious that you don't need to spend too much time to convince anyone else about their promotions. So the reason I ask these set of questions, um, so I hope that you have reflect on some of these in, in your mind. I mean, this is a question I always ask about my, to myself. And I, I ask that to my direct reports as well. This is important. In my opinion, I think what differentiate a good director or great director or just good leader to a great leader is, I think you always need to think about a few things. Like, do you bring more impact to organization? Like, do you think that your team is more efficient than ever? And do you think that you're solving a problem not just for yourself, but also the bigger ecosystem? And finally, do you feel that your team, your direct staff is also doing the same thing so that you help them to grow? So if you, if the four answer, you said that you're very confidently saying that, yes, 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 then I think you're definitely on the right track as a great director of engineering. Now, of course, I, all of us are not perfect. I mean, in, I mean, sometimes when I look at these set of questions, I ask myself, I scratch my head like, hmm, Maybe I haven't done it in the last six months on some of these areas. Um, that's, that is totally okay. I mean, it happens to, to all of us. So if the answer is I like know or you're not sure in some of these questions, that means that it may be some area that you, you want to work on if you aspire to become a great director of engineering. Yeah. It's interesting because I, uh, I know that when some folks think about hiring senior engineering leaders, you know, there's a lot of conversation about like, 
how many people you manage or are you managing managers of managers, et cetera. And I appreciate that what you're describing is a lot more about not the, the size or the volume of your team as much as it is about impact and uh, making a difference and that you're growing and that your team members are growing and that they're making an impact. It sounds like impact is a, is a big part of what makes uh, director of engineering great versus good from what you described. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. I, you know, I think just just one thing I want to be, you know, uh, want to clarify is about like, I mean, size, uh, you know, of an organization definitely is, you know, some way to show about how many people that you bring together to try to solve a problem together. But it should not be the primary consideration. I think you should totally think about like the impact of that. I mean, in theory, you actually want to have a lot of impact with the the small number of people to achieve that outcome. I think this is actually not the opposite. Probably it's not true. Like you want to produce this, you know, this impact by just adding a lot of people. Maybe another way to describe it is about like, okay, let's assume that your team is responsible for supporting a certain part of your business, and maybe the number of users, maybe revenue, or some metrics that you're responsible for. Do you need twenty percent more people in order to achieve twenty percent more result for your metrics that you're responsible for? Like, if the answer is yes, then you should ask, like, can I achieve? like 20% of growth with like 5% more people. Like I think we should always ask this question. That means that our team members are doing more, like doing more through innovation, not doing more by working two more hours, right? Right, so it's it's yeah. not only about impact, but also about maybe efficiency. It's kind of- yeah. kind of to Leverage and innovation, yep. Yeah. Yep, so it's interesting because I've also heard, you know, during the hiring process, like when you get to, you know, hiring a manager of managers, you know, regardless of whether they're, they're managing in scope a team of a hundred or a thousand, like man managing managers of managers, like that role itself, some might argue, doesn't change a lot. But um, taking a look at this first question uh, from Nicola, um, what don't you do anymore as a VP that you did a lot of as a director? I mean, in, in both cases, you may, may be managing managers of managers, um, but What's the difference, you know, if you're if you're doing that as a director versus a VP, like how do you actually assess whether somebody is at one level versus the other? What's the difference between the role at one level versus another, in your opinion? Yeah. So um, again, I, I don't think this is necessarily a step function change. It's probably the the mixture of how you how you, how the composition of your time, like how you spend your time, evolve over time, right? As you shift the responsibility from director to VP. I, I would say that when, when I was a director, I still put a lot of focus as thinking about the deliverables that's happening on a quality basis, or you know maybe for the next couple of quarters. Um, I mean, of course I care about the deliverables as a VP of engineering, but the way that you care about it is different. As a, as a director of engineering, a lot of time you, basically you, you know about the people in your team. You, you know, as a director engineer, you may have like, I don't know, 70 people, 80 people, or 100 people in your team. So you kind of know about what's going on in the organization. You have reasonable way to actually get enough detail to see whether the deliverable is at risk or what do you need to do to intervene the situation. And work with your engineering managers, right, to actually help to solve the problem together. But when you transition from director of engineering to VP of engineering, what you need to do is different. You cannot hands on and try to try to understand the project status and try to innovate. I, I think you need to solve the problem by setting up culture, a sustainable system and vision so that you are trying to get the system in place that people will approximately do it in an expected way. And when there's a problem, people will know when to escalate a problem. When people need to ask, uh, service you the status, like there, people know how to service status to you uh, and the rest of the executive team instead of like you have to go into the meeting in order to understand that. I think the big shift here probably is about um, you know, shifting from building deliverable to building cultures. And you're, you're shifting from a product roadmap to a vision that you need to be able to project to people and say that a few years from now, how all these things is going to come together. And you need to spend more time to, that may be something is maybe counterintuitive or, or intuitive, I don't know. But you need to shift your transition from my team or engineering to the company. And, and let, let me explain this point a little bit more. Um, your effectiveness as a VP of engineering is 
defined by a big part of that, in my opinion, is defined by how much the rest of the executive team and senior leadership team trust you and your team. If they trust you, your team will have a lot of freedom, space, and resources support to get their job done. But if they don't trust you enough, then your team will probably face a lot of friction. And a lot of decisions that you make in your team, whether it's prioritization, whether we should clean up the tech that, I think those decisions will get challenged, or get challenged by other people all the time. I mean, you know, rightfully. But um, on the other hand, like that probably will increase a lot of friction for them to actually get their job done when majority of the time they are getting, they're making the right decision and, and solving a problem properly. So being able to transition to think for the company, understand the context of the company a lot, and make decision for the company will help you to establish your credibility and gain trust from your, your executive team and other senior leaders, which in terms will make your team much more successful. So I think that's what I spend a lot of time as a VP of engineering versus a director of engineering. Maybe it's more internal focused um, to think about deliverables, what I need to ship, what business metric I need to drive within my team. That's interesting. I, I When I think of, uh, you know, day-to-day -day being a director, right? What, what you're describing is kind of that there, you're probably maybe not deeply hands-on, like you're not coding necessarily right. on the on the technology, but you're hands-on in that you might be participating in a design review, you know, or, you know, or, or, or kind of a, um, a major design decision, you know, maybe that's where you might be involved or yep. even a little bit of like who's working on, on what various teams working together. You know, if you have like your front end team and your back end team and, you know, maybe if they have yep. friction and collaborating, you know, helping resolve that. But then what you're describing is, you know, as a VP of engineering, it's more like you're now like representing the engineering organization. You're, you're the, the face of the engineering yep. organization for those around you so that it becomes a lot more, as you were saying about culture, about generating trust, about, you know, and, and the skill set. you know, whereas maybe you were primarily concerned with interacting with engineering, maybe QA folks, maybe product folks, you know, at the VP level now you're, the types of folks you're interacting with might be, you know, it might be the other execs of very different departments and you need to understand the sales side or the finance side, yep. and the people dynamics and a lot of the kind of the interpersonal skills matter. I mean, they, they still matter as a manager no matter what, but it's like they matter even more at the VP level. Is that kind of how you characterize it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think it's like which one is easier or harder. I think it's just a shift. I think it's just a shift about like where you actually get the information and how do you translate the context of information properly so that you represent your team properly to the rest of the function about like what we can do, what we cannot do, how we're going to do that. And instead, a set of confidence to our cross-functional partner. I think that's a very big part of my job. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, I also need to do the reverse of the, the, the other side of the translation is if there's any concerns, if there is any growth opportunities in the organization, sometimes these kind of things come really, really fast. Maybe the CEO or the head of product or the sales team have some new ideas about like, hey, we need to get something done because of the fantastic opportunities ahead of us. So as a hand of engineering, part big part of my job is really work with my leadership team to share the context with them and figure out like what we need to do on the engineering side to support it. I mean, of course, it's not just engineering to, to try to solve that problem, but sometimes to build a solution we need to understand about the limitation of our technology, what the innovation that needs to be built in order to, to, to support that, cap, that set of growth, right? So I think it's bi-directional, it's really about understanding what we can do, what we can empower the growth of the company and share to my peers and vice versa. Yeah. So there's a very related natural question, which happens to be the, the next most upvoted question, which is, you know, if you're already in that figurehead position, it makes sense that, you know, you're going to be using a lot of these cross-functional, cross-departmental communication skills and kind of cultural skills. But when you're not there yet, this question from George is, um, like, what do you wish that you would have learned or practiced as a director to prepare yourself for the VP role? And how do you prepare yourself for the VP role? Um, good question. Um, so, so first of all, I think, you know, I would, not, I would not say that and, and these kind of things is you can prepare for some of them and sometimes it's hard to prepare for all of them. So um, I think it's almost, almost the same. Well, so I, I'm a father, I have an eight-year-old son. Uh, so, you know, I always think about the situation when I first became a, a, a parent. So, and you basically just find that you're not, well, 
before you become a parent, you can always read whatever books and watch YouTube video and say that how to become, how to take care of your children. Uh, but once you actually become a parent on the first day, you figure out that, you know, there's a lot of unexpected things. You've never heard about this. You have never learned the skills or you have never practiced, right? Maybe you have learned it, but you have never practiced that. So um, while we can do as much of preparation, sometime maybe it's just a matter of, you know, once you're on a job, you need to go and do it and realize what's working, what's not working. But, you know, uh, there are definitely some preparation that can be done. Um, I would I would not go come up with another set of theory. I'll go back to the four questions that I asked the team, I mean, asked the audience a little bit earlier. Uh, those will naturally, like if, you know, the few things that you are thinking a lot is about the impact, the efficiency for your team, the, you know, whether your team members are growing with you together or are you expanding your scope of concerns, right? Is your scope of concern only within your team, downward to your team? or you start to understand what is the problem that is happening across the organization. I mean, the starting point probably is because you may not be sitting in the executive team, so you may not be able to hear from other executives directly. But I would challenge all of us to say, you know what, even within my peers, right? Even within my peers, who are a lot of director of engineers in the organization, maybe like there are five other director of engineers or 10 director of engineering, right? Do you understand what is bothering them? Like. If, if that would be a very good starting point. And do you feel that you're, you're, you'll be able to actually try to solve the problem collectively for this group of people? That means you're solving a problem for the engine organization, basically. I think that would be a very good starting point. You just need to practice that. And that is one thing that I find um, I'm still learning and I wish I have done a little bit more is, you know, always think a little bit bigger than what my team is doing. I, I know it's hard because we have pressure, we have business priorities. Basically, uh, business expect my team to deliver X percent of growth or certain technology available by the end of the quarter. And we're spending majority time to think about solving the problem. But the interesting thing is once you become a VP of engineering, you realize that yes, every team is trying to solve the problem independently. And sometimes you observe something interesting that is like people while they're solving that in silo, there's some common problem in the organization that nobody is really looking at. And that probably, it becomes a tragedy of commons. That means like all of us are suffering somehow. Maybe we lose like 10% productivity or you know, our quality suffer. We have like 20% no, more bucks than what we should be, what we should have. Um, and, and, and I think being able to kind of step out a little bit and try to understand, starting from your peer circle and understand what they are solving and what the challenges they have and trying to step in and uh, step up and try to solve those problems, I think would be a good presence yeah, to start with. Mm. So I hear kind of two elements here. One is that you can only do so much preparing and so many book reading because like, <laughs> like any job where there's a lot of interpersonal challenges, you know, like you have to learn how to be a parent. Similarly, you kind of got to learn on the job to handle some of the types of uh, interpersonal situations that you might face as a VP that you just, it's harder to simulate as a director. The other thing that I hear, which I, I personally absolutely love, and I, I write about this topic a, a lot, which is um, the elephants in the room in your organization, or, you know, those dysfunctional things that everybody knows about, but nobody wants to talk about having the bravery and maybe even the vulnerability to engage with those topics and surface those topics and handle those topics that are really organization wide, right? The, the interpersonal things that folks don't want to talk about or that one senior leader that everybody, you know, maybe behind this person's back is saying negative things, but nobody's, you know, communicating to them or their manager and like doing anything about it. You know, it could be, that there's a general business concern that everybody has that nobody's surfacing to the CEO because nobody wants to question the CEO, you know, in terms of their job. It's like having the bravery to consider engaging in those conversations and have some of those, uh, you know, tough conversations, it sounds like, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I think you summarize much better than me. I, I, you know, but but I think that's the gist of that. It's really actually a step out of your comfort zone because I mean, once you become a VP of engineering, that become a big part of your job. That become a big part of your job. So starting to engage with those challenges, and hopefully solve some of these problems will be. I personally think it's one of the best preparations that you can do. Awesome. 
So this next question, now that we're kind of thinking about these skills, there's there are some folks who are listening that are kind of curious to you know imagine like the day in the life of this transition a little bit. So this question from Noah is, can you talk a bit about what it's like to transition from a more tactical focused director role to more vision or strategic focused VP role? Like maybe some of the things that you enjoyed about that transition and the things that you didn't or the things that you didn't expect, you know, any any reflections you have there? Um, I would say I enjoy it for sure. Uh, now, when you ask me in hindsight, it's like, hey, do you like this challenge? It's like, absolutely. I, I learned so much in this journey. Did I feel frustrated or sense of failure at times? Absolutely. So, so let me explain a little bit here. Um, just like I mentioned, I mean, nobody is born to prepare to become a VP of engine. I think we all need to kind of learn. And sometimes it's, it's also uh, timing or situation you know, that we were put in these positions. Um, and, and the interesting thing that I think the biggest transition is, so maybe I, I will engage the audience a little bit on this one as well. So let's think a little bit about it. Like what are the things that is most frustrating about in your current organization? That you're currently in it some again it can be te technical debt it can be inefficient process it can be a build system is broken or it can be people problem um you, you can write it down uh that problem like summary of the problem if you have a piece of paper and then you write it right next to next to a problem like who is supposed to be fixing that problem right it can be male you know, maybe the director of the devops team or something like that right so write down um, if the name that you have written down is not yourself, then this is a transition that is going to happen somewhat differently. Um, because as a VP of engineering, I think if there's some critical problem in organization that really frustrates a lot of the engineers, basically you're yeah, ultimately responsible for that. Like I, I think one transition I, I felt that I had was in the past, whenever there's something is not working on a station, I would just say, well, I mean, it's someone else, right? I mean, um, I can't do, I mean, there's so much I can do about it. Um, oh, I inherited a code base that was written by someone else a long time ago. So it's, you know, a lot of technical debt. I mean, what can I do about that? But at some point when you become a VP of engineering, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. It, it does not mean that you have to hands on fixing all the problems. Just to be clear, I mean, you're not going to be able to like go and change the code and fix everything on day one. And majority of the time you don't do it yourself, but you need to rely on your leader to solve those problems. If those are indeed the most critical problem for the organization and you can no longer point, like, I mean, you cannot point to your product guys and say that, okay, you know, we have a problems, right? And you need to take care of that. Like, no, like this is your problem. Like you need to take care of that for your organization. And ultimately, if some of this problem is not solved for whatever reasons uh, by your leaders, like you have the ultimate responsibility on finding a different solutions, right? Maybe find a different person to work on that, re or like do whatever it takes to solve that problem. Excuse no longer matter, right? As you become a leader, head of engineering organization to bring, to bring the sanity back in organization. So that's one thing that I, I think is a big change for myself. And at the very beginning, it can be very frustrating. I would say um, my personal story was, um, you know, I think the imposter syndrome at that point really kicks in. Uh, in fact, you know, well, rationally, I think you'll be able to understand that, well, those are difficult problems. I mean, the reason that they linger around in the organization for a few years, there's a reason for that. It's because those are complex problems. There's hardly a good solution to solve those problems by anyone. But on the other hand, when you're given a charter to become the VP of engineering, head of engineering, to try to solve this problem, you definitely want to see progress of that. I mean, that's part of your job. You, you're, 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 you're empowered to solve those problems, and you have all the resources to support you to solve the problem. So um, when you're not seeing progress in short terms, then you start having doubts in your mind about, hmm, Richard, did someone actually make a wrong bet to put you into VP of engineering because you didn't seem to make any progress in the last three months on any on these like 15 problems that is ahead of you? So what's going on in here? So I think that is definitely one, you know, one thing during the transition that I felt that I struggled at the very beginning about like I don't feel that I have confidence that I can solve those problems because I didn't see progress in there. 
So one thing that I I feel a big lesson for me is uh, you know maybe a couple of things that I, I learned about it. So number one is um, have a rational understanding of those problems. So sometimes we can easily go get stuck about like okay there's a problem, and then we we'll say that I need to think about all the solution, and because it seems that I'm the most experienced, most senior person in the organization. But in fact, when you actually go and open it up, the problem is about, hey, maybe there's a personal problem. You try to talk to people in your organization. You know, of course, you need to select the right set of people about that. I think they will be able to give you perspective that you never have. And then they probably will give you some empathy about like, oh, yeah, this is you know difficult problems. We have tried this, tried that, tried that. Um, so it gives you some confidence about like, yes, this is a difficult problem. And maybe the suggestion is similar to what you are thinking about or executing on. So you know that at least you are on the right track on solving the problem as most people are anticipating. So it gives you some self confidence. I think the other thing is uh, also not just about you know counting the progress on day to day basis. I think that's one big shift from a director of engineering to a VP of engineering, uh, or from engineering manager to the, to a VP of engineering at the end. So I think the as an engineering manager. Maybe the first time of oh, oh, the progress that you see in your team probably is talking about every spring, you see some progress. Like every two weeks, there's something gets shipped out to production, and the team celebrate on on the business result of that. Uh, maybe if a director of engineering is more than a sprint, maybe a quarter or a couple of quarters, you talk about some some improvement of business result. But a lot of things on the VP of engineering side, probably you you just need to understand that things would just take quarters, if not years. To get to the final outcome, and actually, that's part of the, the the job definition. The job definition is that you are trying to bring the organization to make them long term successful by having a rise of culture and vision. So I, I just feel that uh, that's definitely something that I'm still learning, but I definitely struggle quite a lot at beginning to change my mindset about like how I need to think about a problem, how do I define a successful organization, so that I don't frustrate myself every day about like there's no progress on something that has been lingering for an organization. So uh, a big part of what I what I heard there is, you know, a lot of the organizational problems that are complex, that are easy to just accept and say that's just how it is, and use that as a constraint to which to do your job. It's it's kind yeah. of a simpler way of working. And like as a director, you might be able to do that, but as a VP, a lot of those black boxes, those black box complex problems actually your responsibility to open the black box and to go and look and see what's causing the problem, what's causing the breakdown between these two organizations, what's causing the cultural challenge that we have, or if we have an issue with diversity, you know, what's the, why is that? Like having to think about all of these questions where before they weren't even, you know, you, you didn't, even if you knew they were there, you didn't have to like question them or look into them, that that's a, a big transition, which I completely understand. Uh, a related question to this is, you know, obviously very technical folks like to measure and assess, you know, how to get things done. And as a director, you can do what kind of what you described, right? Look at what you've delivered in, you know, every few weeks or in the quarter, be able to really measure that progress. But when you're talking about these very nebulous kind of concepts of, you know, culture and interacting with folks and, you know, the elephants in the room, how do you measure performance for something like that? Are there any specific metrics that you might be able to even look at to know that you're you're doing a good job with these things yeah so i can well so i mean there's definitely it's not complete science i think it's a there's some arts in there for sure uh, and at this level but um but we do measure the performance of of the organization uh through a process that we we've been doing for years now um we have two major processes that's happening at my level. So number one is we have a three-year vision, the engine organization vision, that talks about like how how does the organization look like in three years, right? Primarily measured by a few things. Uh, some level of the measurement is about the people, like basically, you know, people. Then I will say, where do people like, where do people sit? Like, is it only sitting in Mountain View or sitting in the rest part of the world? Because there's a vision, like. I personally, like for example, in our organization, we have already made a decision to say that we want to get talents from anywhere in the world to help to solve the you know interesting problems at, at Coursera. So, and one of the strategy for us is to expand outside of the Bay Area to get the talent from other countries. And uh, so, some of these measurement is about like, hey, long term, 
how does the shape of the organization look like in terms of where people are? It may also be we have sometimes we may observe a talent gap. Maybe we're missing certain skills or missing certain seniorities. So you need to make a commitment in the organization and say that in three years of time frame, we need to bridge this kind of talent gap by hiring people of certain skills and hiring people of certain seniority, not as an individual, but as a group of individuals that you'll be able to measure and say, okay, now we have instead of like having 1% of the senior staff engineer. Now we actually enrich the organization with like 5% of senior staff engineer because we see the business need that kind of skills for us to be successful. So you think a lot about things on the organization side, what are the, the most important indicator to support the growth of the business? And you write it down and say three years from now, what, what do you want it to be? I mean, of course, diversity is one part of that as well. And then we also measure my team in terms of two other elements. Number one is about the quality of our work. So when I say the quality of work is not on the business side about like, hey, we increase like 10% of the users. Like that one, we are capturing on our kind of overall business you know, operation OKRs. But um, in, in our three vision, we absolutely capture about our aspiration about some measurement of us, the, the stability of our system, like basically the availability of our system, availability of each of the services, the type of like test metrics that we have in our organization to guarantee that we have super high confidence whenever we ship something out. We know that it is working, not because of luck, but because of evidence, right? Automated testing, right? So you capture some of these like very important strategic initiative as the company grow and become, you know, uh, 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 an important imperative workflow for your customers. Something that you cannot go wrong is about their trust on your system. And that trust of the system, part of that for sure is about the product feature you build, but a big part of that is actually how robust your systems are. If your system is down all the time, or always have errors or glitches here and there, your customers are not going to trust you a lot. So, and who has the best you know, control on producing a robust system that your customer can, can, can believe in and feel comfortable using it? I think it's engineering. So that's definitely one big part of, me big part of measurement. It's about you write down about aspirationally, how to measure and show it to other people that your engineering system is reliable and behind the scene that will actually trigger a lot of conversation about like while wow, our technical architecture right now does not allow us to scale to that level or technical architecture causes all these problems today that requires escalation and a lot of resource to deal with those problems so to naturally actually drive the rise out conversation organization about like how do we improve our technology and processes to get to that outcome and then you measure the progress of that you measure by your uptime, you measure by number of critical bugs that happen, you measure by availability of your APIs. So you do a bunch of things to measure that. And finally, the last part of that is the productivity of your team. Now, now we know that productivity is very, very hard to measure for engineering. So definitely it's not by number of lines of code. Um, and I know there's, there's no perfect metrics, but one thing we definitely look at is about, we focus a lot on like how much our engineers are waiting when I say waiting, that could be they're waiting for the bill, they're waiting to deploy, they are stuck in using a tool in order to actually get their job, like when they need to troubleshoot the site, they spend like three hours to look for a log file instead of two minutes to get to a log file, right? So we do measure a set of proxy metrics, probably not the you know, realistic metrics about like, our productivity is like 5% or 100%, but a set of proxy measures that say like, oh, we all understand that those are extreme inefficient thing that people are just wasting time in doing. So we do measure that, and we have some metrics on this. So in summary, basically, it's about you measure something on the organization level about the vision on how people are distributed, the skills that is needed. You measure something on the quality, the craftsmanship of the work of your organization, and you measure some form of productivity. Basically, it's like how much time people are wasting. That's great. I love this yeah. summary. So in, in, in my own words, the, the way I see these three groups is kind of this this first set of metrics is kind of somewhat dictated by the business and that may come from OKRs, it may come from, you know, a grand vision or plan that, you know, maybe the CEO has or that you have for the team and where you want to see it go as it relates to cultural elements and diversity. And those things can be quantified just by writing down those goals and having, you know, 
key results that you define on your own. And maybe that's where you kind of have to think outside the box a little bit to come up with that list. You can't really pull it from a book necessarily. And then there's the, the second set, which is our traditional metrics that we're probably more comfortable with, whether they be uptime or, you know, you know, critical bugs. One favorite one for me is is number of regressions because I find that you know regressions, the number of regressions you have correlates highly to you know the trust folks have in your in your products that it will keep working one day you know the same yes. way as the day before. Um, and so that there's that set of metrics, and then there's a separate set of metrics around, for lack of better words, productivity and sort of like team driven metrics and whether they be informed by velocity kinds of metrics. They can also be looked at by looking at the internal tools that people use, et cetera, yep. to make sure that folks are efficient. So those three things, that's that's great. And it's a great way of looking at it. I think a really great framework. So thank you for that. Yeah, and then we do we do set, uh, I think the other part of that, not just important to look at that, right? It's important to set goals and a regular cadence, right? So we do do that. Uh, so every year we have this like three year vision setting. So we always look forward for the next three years with what do we want to achieve, right? And then at the end of the year, we also come up with our one year priorities. Basically it's like, oh, that three year vision that you have determined, you say that for the next year, which part of the puzzle we need to crack for the next year. And then you set some specific goals for that year. And you know, on a regular quarter, on a regular basis, you just review those metrics with the team. Sometimes our solutions for those problems may not be correct on the first time. And just like any business problem you have, you, you just iterate and, and figure out new things and solve the problem gradually towards the goal. I love it, I love it. So this next question is a little bit of a, of a shift, but I think uh, a, a juicy one that I think people are curious about. I, you know, sometimes when people describe information, they describe, you know, things that a person knows that they know, things that a person that they know that they don't know, you know, like flying a plane for most people, and then things that they don't know that they don't know, right? Or they don't even know, so they don't even know to ask and think about it. I think about that as it relates to this this next question from Ling, which is, um, what was the biggest challenge for you when transitioning from director to VP for for you personally? I think I captured some of this about you know the imposter syndromes and don't know the solutions and and things like that. But you know, you want to share actually more about the imposter syndrome piece because I think that's one that a lot of people can resonate with, but leaders don't always talk about. Like, what was that? What was that for you? And when you were, uh, becoming- you know, I think I think there 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 is something that's first simple but obvious, right? So, um, so when you get into well, so having been an engineer for many years or a director of engineering for many years, you basically lean in a lot of your skills as as a technology expert in many ways, right? Whether it's about the, the actual architecture or how you build software. So you know a lot of things like that. So in the past, when you actually sit in a meeting, majority of the time that you're sitting with your engineering peers, you kind of understand that like 89% of what they are talking about. You may not have the solution for them, but you know you kind of understand that what everybody is talking about. But once you actually transition to you know become VP engineer, you're sitting in the executive team. Now there's a bunch of people. Majority of the topics they are talking about is like okay, they talk about financial statement. They're talking about some of the marketing event that's going to happen. The sales team is talking about like how they are going to kind of, you know, what are some of the challenges or opportunities for them to actually expand into a new different market and all these different roles in the sales team. When you see in this meeting, like at least at, when, at the very beginning, I just feel like, oh, am I, am I useful here? Like I have no idea about what they are talking about. I'm not able to contribute in many of these conversations. They brought up and said, oh, this is so important for a company, we should talk about that. Like, I don't know how I should contribute to that conversation. So that makes you question about like, hmm, maybe they need to find someone who's much better, much more knowledgeable than me to engage in that conversation because it seems like I, I can offer no value uh, to that group. And uh, when I bring up about the topics of uh, engineering, it seems that nobody is really that much interested in, in that, but maybe part of that is they don't understand that as well. So <laughs> there's definitely an element of that. But you know, at the very beginning, I really struggle and and uh, think about like, okay, how I should contribute to that. Um, um, so I spent some time talking to. You no, know, I think the way that I deal with that is I, uh, except for you know, going to executive meeting, you know, listening to those conversations, I just spend time with some of my cross-functional partners, and uh, on one-on-one basis. You know, part of that is just say, hey. I actually didn't understand what you were talking about. 
in a meeting. It, it's a little bit tough because you know people kind of expect you as a, oh you should be knowledgeable about that. You need to say tell people that you you don't understand what's going on, right? Um, it, it was not easy, but I I determined that was the only way that I can become effective. I mean I know that I will never be hundred percent understanding what they are talking about because they are the experts, right? But I just feel that I need to know enough about that. So. You know, I just spend time with my cross-functional partner, try to get an understanding about like those problems, those definitions of the terms of what they're talking about. If they have a challenge, I just admit that like I won't be able to help them, seems like, but happy to see what we can do on the engineering side uh, to support them. And and interesting enough, like most people are actually very like I think all of the people actually I work with are very supportive. They 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 are understanding. They they want to help. They want to share about what they know to you, um, even though they are super busy, right? And on the other hand, when you actually ask about expectation to them, they actually don't have like very strong expectation about like, hey, Richard, you should be able to solve a problem for a sales side. I mean, they they want you to understand enough and have empathy on that, but no one actually expects you to solve those problems for them. Um, so I think that's one way. I, I feel that when when I was in that situation. I just need to accept that and try to find ways to learn about that and you know expose a little bit of vulnerability to to my peers. Um, I have and it turned out okay, yeah. Good. Yeah. Now I have two reflections kind of related to that that maybe is encouraging for folks that may find themselves in a similar position. One is the research about vulnerability and oxytocin, the trust and love chemical. And what basically the summary is is that if you want to induce oxytocin in someone else's brain, which is, again, the chemical that causes them to trust. There's two ways to do it. One is through physical touch and the other is through vulnerability. So when you express that vulnerability of, hey, I actually don't know the answer to this question, you're generating oxytocin in their brain, which causes them to trust you more. And you know, it's a wonderful technique to have that vulnerability because it causes people to then share very openly with you. That's one thing I'll mention. The other thing I'll mention is I reflect on this from a uh, human computer interaction school, you know, at CMU in like whatever, 2004. Um, you know, they talk about heuristic analysis, which is this ability to look at an interface and identify the flaws with that interface uh, according to a set of uh, principles. And what they found from this research is that novices identify things that experts don't. So if you want to cover the whole range of identifying these issues with something, you actually need a combination of experts and novices. And the same is true for things like marketing events and sales numbers and everything else that there's actually a value from having a novice's input, from having a beginner's mind input, from having the mind of somebody that hasn't seen these things before. And the stupid questions can oftentimes lead people to conversations that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise, right? So. You know, if, if for those who feel like an imposter, first of all, you're not alone. It's very, very common, you know, as you become more and more senior. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality is, is that there's a value to bringing the beginner's mind to the table, you know? Does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I, I you know, it, it's not like I have solved this problem forever. Like every time when there's a new challenge, when there's a new set of things that's happening, then often this thing will come back to you and say, okay, something new is happening at the company. And people talk about something that you have no idea about what's going on. And I think the only change I, I've, I've learned about is about I, now I lean in and try to just say, hey, I don't understand that. Maybe, you know, if you don't feel comfortable about that, uh, to, to speak in public about in front of everyone, say, I don't understand it, like go and talk to people on a one on one basis and say that, hey, you know what? I, I just really didn't understand that. Tell me a little bit about how I can learn more about it. Uh, you'd be surprised on how much people actually accept that and support it. Yeah, hundred percent. Like people want you to be successful, right? We have a yeah. few more minutes. I want to ask this question from Wayne. Um, I think this comes from like you know when people are actually thinking of hiring. Let's say that they're in an SVP position and they're hiring a VP of engineering versus a director. If a CEO asks you what the business justification is to have someone in the role of engineering director versus the role of engineering VP, how would you answer? Um, I think the the way that I, I mean, definitely these kinds of questions uh, happen, right? So the way a structure will be focusing on not about the title, but structure based on the skills that's needed in the organization. So I mean, the reason you need to hire someone is because 
there's a skills gap, right? I mean, the skills gap can be like you have people, but they don't have the skills yet, or maybe you don't have that person to start with. Maybe you're starting a new product, new technology, that you don't have anyone in the organization uh, that can do that. So I think it's very important for you to be able to articulate about the skills that is needed for that individual. Sometimes can be about like, hey, you know what? We need to scale our system to support, you know, 200 million users, right? And we don't know how to do that. I mean, we, we try, but you know, we don't know how to do that. So we need to hire someone that have that kind of expertise to help us design that system because the business is going in certain ways, right? Um, just an example. Now, when you're able to articulate about like why you're hiring this person, what kind of skill that's needed, right? You have a job description. And when you have that job description, then a reasonable thing for you to say is about, okay, let's look at what other companies are hiring people of a very similar profile, require a very similar skill set, and try to see what other companies are giving the title and the charter to that individual, right? So if you have a robust spec to the job description, hopefully you'll be able to easily find and say that, you know what? When look at all the other talent competitors that we have been working with, uh, we, we have been uh, competing with, they all hire this person as a director. Then that person probably is a director level type of person. If that all our competitors are hiring that person as a VP of engineering, then you just show the evidence and say that, you know, you see all these 10 companies, they have people similar. They are all called the VP of engineering. And we are trying to hire someone that is doing, performing the same set of things. We won't be able to hire a director of engineering to perform this task. Like, nobody is going to accept this job. So that's why we need to have a VP of engineering. So it sounds like you're identifying the skills gaps and then based off of those gaps, you look at the people out there that are that have those skills that you need and you see are those people typically directors or typically VPs. I also imagine based off of what you were saying earlier that you know somebody that's much more deeply hands-on with a lot of the, the kind of day-to-day -day might be more likely to be a director whereas somebody that can have those influential conversations with folks at that you know top executive level and be able to think beyond engineering and have the elephant in the room difficult conversations and navigate the political environment where you know like if that's a skills gap you know that that might be one reason for for a VP. One more question here, last one here is um, from Arjita. How do you how did you convince your manager? that you're ready to go as a VP. There are probably a lot of folks here that are, are directors and they are they 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 know that they're ready to be a VP or they feel that they're ready to be, to be a VP. Their manager doesn't think so. Like how, you know, how can you convince your manager, or, you know, be able to, to get that role if you think you're ready for it? Um you know, I I, I hope that that's not a uh, one-off process. So it's not one meeting, you basically say that, okay, now I'm now ready to be VP of Engine, what are you gonna do about that? I think that this needs to build up over time. And it goes back to, again, the first four questions that I, I asked the audience at the very beginning. I think every time when you reflect on those questions, you feel that you have made accomplishment, you have made progress on those questions. Like these should be brought up in the regular conversation between you and your manager and say that, hey, these are the new things that I've tried and this is what, you know, what are some of the results that happen. These are new problems that I have solved for the station. This is what the outcome of that. I think this is an ongoing progress that needs to get built up over time. And I think for any smart manager, basically the head of engineering, I hope that they are smart enough to figure out that, wow, David or whoever I, uh, that we're talking about, You've been solving the problem from this size relatively to the need of the organization to now that to the need of the organization. And a lot of problem that you're solving is benefiting the rest of the whole company, not just about for your individual teams, right? I think any reasonable people will be able to understand that and give you that opportunity when the time comes. Of course, I mean, this is something that you should be honest and, and tell your manager as well, like, hey, my career aspiration is to become a VP of engineering. So these are the things that I've been doing. I'd love to learn about to see what are the gaps and what are the other things that you want me or what are the big problems I'd like you to solve. Uh, you'd like me to solve, right? Uh, before I can become the VP of engineering. I think this is a more conversation that needs to happen multiple times a year. And, but a big part of the preparation definitely is about like how much you are making progress and you can show those evidence. And the rest is hopefully it's pretty straightforward if you are really doing those jobs, yeah.
makes sense. You know, it's an ongoing conversation. Richard, I want to thank you so much for your time and energy and your wisdom. I, I learned a lot. Hopefully, the uh, audience learned a lot as well. And um, wish you a wonderful rest of your day.